Dear EMP students, this is Dr. Ali Sabur, Professor of Vascular Surgery at Shams Medical School, and this recorded presentation about surgical site infection comes in two parts. This is part one. By the end of this lecture, you will be able to explain why patients undergoing surgical interventions are more prone to develop wound and systemic infections, diagnose surgical site infection and its complications in a given clinical description or in a given picture, and propose management outlines, classify surgical wounds according to bacterial contamination, and decide the need for antibiotic prophylaxis accordingly, explain the physiological and pharmacological basis of antibiotic surgical prof prophylaxis guidelines, and in the face-to-face -face session, you will apply the knowledge you acquired on virtual case scenarios and clinical situations. Surgical site infection has always been a major complication of surgery. It is considered one of the hospital acquired, what we call nosocomial infections, that includes as well hospital acquired respiratory infections, urinary tract infections related to urinary catheters, and bacteremia related to vascular lines and vascular catheters. Some important definitions should be explained first. You should know that the presence of microorganisms on the skin, in the mouth, or within the gut does not mean infection. That is colonization. And these are usually normal flora. So colonization is the presence of bacteria in or on a host without causing immune responses or signs of disease. On the other hand, infection is microorganisms that invade and provokes a sustained immune response and signs of disease. Surgical site infection is defined as an infection that occurs at the operative incision site within 30 days after surgery. Note that if a prosthetic implant is used, deep infection within up to one year is still considered surgical site infection. We will discuss different classifications of surgical site infection later in this presentation. The invasion of microorganisms through tissues following breakdown of local and systemic defenses will lead to local and systemic clinical manifestations. The local manifestations of wound infection is discussed later. However, the systemic response of the body is called systemic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS. Sepsis is a life-threatening body response to severe infection or tissue necrosis due to excessive production of cytokines that causes organ dysfunction and progressive organ failure. Sepsis can lead to multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, moods, which is the effect that severe infection produces systemically, and multisystem organ failure, which is the end stage of uncontrolled moods. The clinical criteria for diagnosis of SIRS. A patient is described to have systemic inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS, if he develops two of the following. Hypothermia above 38 or hypothermia below 36 tachycardia above 90 per minute, tachypnea above 20 per minute, a white cell count above 12,000 or below 4,000. If infection is documented, the patient is described to have sepsis. Note that SIRS occurs as well in patients with pancreatitis, ischemia, multiple trauma, and tissue injury, hemorrhagic shock as well, immune-mediated organ injuries, 
all of them can be accompanied with SIRS. We will give clinical examples to test your understanding of these definitions in the face-to-face -face session. The data and numbers in this table are not intended to be memorized. The aim of providing you with this table is to illustrate the difference between moods, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, and multiple system organ failure. We will explain more in the face-to-face -face session. Why are surgical or trauma patients more prone to develop surgical site infection? Well, several factors interact to determine whether bacteria inoculated into a surgical wound would cause wound infection or not. The host immune response, the dose of bacterial inoculum, and the bacterial virulence. Surgical patients are more prone to develop surgical site infection because of several factors. Some factors are common in all patients. These factors should be always considered and managed. The intact epithelial surface of the skin is a mechanical barrier that prevents invasion of microorganisms. This barrier is broken with trauma or surgery. Surgery can inoculate bacteria, normally present on the skin and in the gut, into abnormal sites where they become pathogenic. After skin incision, the acute inflammatory humoral and cellular defense mechanisms take up to four hours to be mobilized and active. This is called the decisive period. And it is the time when invading bacteria may become established in the tissues. So if you decide to give prophylactic antibiotics, it should be given to cover this period and the time when the skin is incised, the tissue level of antibiotics should be above the minimum inhibitory concentration for the pathogens likely to be encountered in this situation. So you expect skin pathogens with skin incisions, gut pathogens if you are going to open the gut. The size of the bacterium inoculum that's the number of the organisms, is directly related to the development of surgical site infection. Strict adherence to the aseptic technique and theta regulations reduces this unavoidable wound contamination to a minimum. Reduction of the operative time does the same effect. Again, surgical patients are more prone to develop surgical site infection because of several factors. Other factors are present in some patients. These can be avoided or taken in consideration during management. Associated comorbidities in some surgical patients can further compromise immunity and healing power. Those are the high risk group for developing surgical site infection. Patients with diabetes, uremia, or patients receiving immunosuppression are prototypes of these patients. Obese patients as well are more susceptible to develop surgical site infection. Poor surgical technique is an avoidable cause that can predispose to surgical site infection. Unnecessary tissue dissection devitalizes tissues and make them more susceptible to bacterial invasion and colonization. You should close any dead space while you, when you are closing your wound to avoid exudate collection. Meticulous hemostasis is important, that is to avoid hematoma collection.
any collection or hematoma is a good media for bacterial growth. Leaving foreign material within the wound increases the possibility of surgical site infection. It can harbor bacteria. So avoid using non-absorbable braided sutures under the skin. That is typically skin, uh, sorry, that's typically the silk sutures. Drains are important, but do not overuse them. And do not leave them in place unnecessarily for too long. Of course, the use of surgical meshes, joint prosthesis, artificial vascular grafts increases the risk of surgical site infection. And all these patients need antibiotic surgical prophylaxis even if their operations are classified as clean operations. You will now you will know about this later. Poor tissue perfusion in shock, hypothermia, poor tissue oxygenation, all compromises the local tissue ability to resist bacterial invasion. So please monitor patients to avoid hypotension, ensure proper oxygenation during operation and in the recovery room, and avoid hypothermia. This is especially important in children and in elderly. The host response is further weakened by malnutrition. If starvation is prolonged, this factor should be considered. The effect of suspended oral feeding will be explained in the face-to-face -face session. The effect of suspended oral feeding and its role in the development of SIRS and MOODS will be discussed in the face-to-face -face session. Surgical site infection can be classified based on the depth of the wound infection, the etiology underlying, the time of occurrence of infection, the severity of infection. In this lecture, we will focus on surgical site infection based on depth of infection. So we will classify surgical site infection according to the depth of infection. Surgical wounds are classified according to the depth of wound infection into superficial, where infection involves only the skin and subcutaneous tissue of the incision, deep infection involving deep tissues such as fascial and muscle layers. This also includes infection involving both superficial and deep incision sites and organ spaces draining through the incision. Organ space surgical site infection, that is infection involving any part of the anatomy in organs and spaces other than the incision, which was opened or manipulated during operation. Superficial incisional surgical site infection. The infection occurs within 30 days after the operation. It involves only the skin or subcutaneous tissue and includes at least one of the following. A purine discharge or a purine drainage is present. Here, cultured documentation is not required. Organisms that can be isolated from the fluid or from the tissue of the superficial incision. At least one sign of inflammation, example, pain or tenderness, induration, erythema, local warmth of the wound, any one of these, if it is present, this can diagnose superficial surgical site infection. Or if the wound is deliberately opened by the surgeon. Of course, for suspicion or for the management of surgical site infection. Note that 
a wound is not considered a superficial incisional surgical site infection if a stitch abscess is present, what we call the stitch sinus. If the incision is at an episiotomy, if the infection is at the episiotomy, or circumcision site, or a burn wound, or if the surgical site infection extends into the fascia or the muscles. If pus is present, the wound should be opened and drained. Deep incisional surgical site infection is characterized by the following. It occurs within 30 days of the operation or within one year if an implant is present. It involves deep soft tissue, example fascia and all muscles of the incision, and it includes at least one of the following. Purulent discharge present in the deep incision, but without organ space involvement. Fascial dehiescence or fascia is deliberately separated by the surgeon to drain infection because of signs of inflammation. A deep abscess is identified by direct examination or during reoperation by histopathology or by radiological examination. Now, organ or space surgical site infection is characterized by the following. It occurs within 30 days of the operation or within one year of an implant if it is implanted. It involves an anatomical structure that is not opened or manipulated during the operation. And it includes at least one of the following. Purulent drainage present from a drain placed by a stab wound into the organ space. Organisms isolated from the organ or space by aseptic culturing techniques. Or a deep abscess in the organ or the space is identified by direct examination during reoperation re or by histopathological or radiological examination. This is the end of part one of surgical site infection. Part two will discuss antibiotic surgical prophylaxis and principles of surgical site infection management. Thank you.